Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, the meeting of the WVU Faculty Senate will come to order. I'd like to begin with a roll call from our regional campuses. Uh, first of all, Potomac State, how many are present? Potomac State has three present. Okay, that's good. It looks like you're all there. Um, and at West Virginia Tech, how many are present? WVU Tech has three senators present. Okay, good, thank you. So our, uh, our first agenda item is, is the minutes of the November 13th Faculty Senate meeting, and they've been distributed as an annex with your agenda. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the November meeting? In Tech or Potomac State, do you have any corrections? Okay, hearing none, then the minutes are approved as written. And uh, next item is a report from President Gordon Gee. I just said I'm glad she's drinking Diet Dr. Pepper. That makes me feel right at home, as a matter of fact. Good afternoon, everyone. Come on, good afternoon. We hope all of you are going to come to the uh, to the university residence for our holiday party. I, that's the reason I was late. I was over cooking and cleaning. <laughs> Don't believe that. I can assure you that that's not true. So, um, and and today we have uh, we have a number of folks here who are really going to talk about some of the things that uh, that, that I would normally talk about, like West Virginia Forward and um, and uh, uh, several other things. So I'm going to try to be very short because I think it's uh, it's a day for us to uh, move our agenda on and to celebrate just a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, the university has been very involved in. Um, leading the, the discussion regarding energy and the potential of energy and clean energy, a variety of other things for some time. And Brian Anderson, uh, under his leadership, has done a terrific job. As you know, we have now signed a memorandum with the, China, with the Chinese energy um, uh, system to, um, to work closely with them on energy issues. It's a fairly sub substantial commitment, $83.5 billion. Someone asked me, is it real? And I said, well, it, we'll just take half of it. Uh, that'll be all right. Well, 40 billion would be fine with me. But um, it will impact this state. It will impact our future. It will impact the opportunities for research and, uh, and creativity on the behalf of the university. And so we are very grateful for that. And that leadership comes from, um, from Brian Anderson. It comes from our, our faculty here. It comes from... Uh, the National Energy Technology Laboratory. It comes from, um, obviously, from our governor's office and from, um, and from Secretary of, uh, of, uh, of Commerce, Woody Thrasher, so we want to thank him. Um, the, uh, the other thing I want to say is that, um, you know, our f we continue to raise money, which is good, because that is what the difference between good and great at a university, particularly a public university, is the kind of private support we can raise. Now, we had this day of giving. Many of you participated. Um, in taking a look, this is the first time that we've done it 24 hours, in taking a look at what we expected to uh, raise, um, I, I told everyone I thought we'd probably raise about a million dollars. Um, Penn State had done about half a million dollars, Notre Dame had done about 1.3 million, and I thought we'd kind of come in between those two. Uh, we came in at three million. And the reason I think that's important, obviously we always appreciate the money, but more importantly, it shows the kind of commitment that we have from so many people that they were willing to, uh, on just a short notice, to provide that kind of support. And, I, and, and if you're a faculty member of this university, that ought to be very gratifying to you because uh, it shows that uh, there is tremendous uh, commitment and support uh, from so many uh, for what we're trying to do at the university. Um, I, I would like to say that we've had a number of student accomplishments, but I particularly want to note that Colin Lopez, um, Colin Lopez has been selected as our university's first Schwartzman uh, scholar, as you know. Um, uh, Steve Schwartzman uh, uh, decided that he was going to start the equivalent of the Rhodes Scholarship, and um, 142 students worldwide were chosen to study um, in China rather than at Oxford. And, um, and Colin is going to uh, Shenhua University, as you know, the two major universities in China, Shenhua and Beijing. Shenhua is the technical university. Beijing is the, is the liberal arts institution. And uh, he has been selected to go there. Um, uh, Colin is from uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, he competed, by the way, uh, against over 4,000 um, 
candidates from around the world. Um, and for the second straight year, our university will have two teams in NASA's Mars um, uh, Ice Challenge. Only nine universities were selected again to uh, participate in the challenge, which seeks, um, uh, which seeks uh, revolutionary methods to drill into uh, and extract water from simulated Martian um, uh, subsurface ice stations. I have no idea why we would even want to do that, but it sounds very interesting to me, and I'm grateful for that. And then our hospitality and tourism management uh, program is taking center stage in the in in industry with the Mountaineer um, student team capturing first place in the international student um, market study competition in New York City. I only give you these because sometimes we don't realize that uh, the day-to-day -day work that you do is then found in wonderful uh, results uh, and our students compete on the world stage. Um, so this weekend we're going to have yet another commencement and I like this fact, we're going to have two commencements. You know, we have a whole host of commencements during the, uh, during the spring now. I, I'm, I made it no secret that I'd love to have one big commencement and then divide them up again. I think that that way we can come together and celebrate. Um, now we have our stadium completed, but every time I mention that uh, I get driven off the stage. So I, um, but we're going, to, uh, uh, we're going to graduate 2,800 students, which will be um, the most we've ever graduated. We're having so many graduate this uh, December that we ha now will have to divide into two commencements. And the reason that that is important is the fact that it shows that our retention rates and our graduation rates are going up, and that's exactly what we want to have. So in the close of this season, we have much to celebrate. We have many challenges in front of us. You'll hear about those, with, uh, but I think that um, uh, we can feel very confident that we are facing those challenges and that we have um, a wonderful opportunity, I think, to do unique things among uh, public universities and land-grant institutions. Saying that, I again invite all of you to join us um, at our holiday reception at, the, at Blaney House and look forward to having a chance to, uh, to uh, join with all of you. Now, say, uh, are there any questions that I can answer for any of you? Any questions? I miss Mark Brasidas. He was always my, my number one questioner, but now I'm going to go question him on st city council. How does that sound? Everyone have a great day. We'll see you later, okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Provost uh, Joyce McConnell. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, the end of the semester, everyone's tired, ready for a party at Blaney. Um, should be a nice reception. And thank you, Mr. President, for having us to your home. You probably feel like you're constantly invaded. Um, he's, he has, has, this season is the season for parties for the president, right? They just keep rolling on. Um, but I wanted to bring to your attention something that I think is very important um, about leadership and recognizing leadership in that Matt Valenti, um, who is, as you know, professor in the Lane Department of Computer Science Electrical Engineering, and of course our current president of Faculty Senate, has been named a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And he probably won't tell you that, but that's a big deal. Um, on other really great news, um, and I'm very excited about this, two music faculty members have been nominated for a Grammy, um, which we're really excited about. Two of the music faculty, Lucy Morrow and Mark Benacosa, have been nominated for a Grammy Award in international classical music for their album, Mademoiselle, Premier Audience, Unknown Music of Nadia Boulanger. Professor Morrow plays piano and produced the album. Professor Benincosa was a co-producer and the recording engineer. Um, I don't think they're here, but I want to congratulate them both. That's a wonderful achievement, so we're very excited. <laughs> Gordon already told you about Colin Lopez, and we're very excited about him having a Schwartzman, one of the first. Um, and some other good news, two of our uh, students from the Launch Lab Network competed in the St. Louis Elevator Pitch Competition. Um, they were given 40 seconds to sell their business ideas to investors, and senior Ethan Ball represented the College of B&E. Sophomore Nima Shahab Shamir represented WVU Tech, 
for the first time in a national pitch co competition. And I believe that uh, Ethan Ball won the $1,500 prize for his 40-second pitch. So we're very excited about that. Um, I do want, just want to bring to your attention a couple of things that have been sent to you in case you've missed them during this busy season. You might want to go back and look for them. Um, I sent you out something, uh, at least what we knew at the time, on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, attached to that was a sheet that were FOQ, FAQs. Um, and in addition, I believe that we attached the Moody Investors Report about what it perceived to be the uh, state of um, higher education should those cuts go through. Um, I just, um, in front of all of you, I want to give a shout out to the team that made that all possible. That was a wonderful uh, team, uh, team product. It was our government relations people on the ground. Um, it was Rob Alsop, it was UR. Um, all going in there and making sure that we had the right information and getting it to you um, in a timely way. Uh, we also, uh, you probably received, hopefully received our email about the travel ban. And um, that, again, was a, a great reflection of our teamwork on that. Um, I wanted to tell you that in the up uh, in the upcoming legislative session, Campus Carry will once again be um, on the agenda, we've been working and meeting. Chief Roberts is here today. Um, we've been meeting and confirmed our position in opposition to campus carry. I believe the faculty senate has a resolution to that regard, and as does our staff council. So we'll keep you up to date. And remember, the legislative session starts much earlier this year because it's not an election year. So we'll get back and head almost immediately into the legislative session. So we will keep you updated on that. Um, and I think that that is it for my announcements, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Are there any from Potomac State or from Tech? No questions. Thank you. OK, thanks. So next up is me, my report. And uh, first of all, just an update on our Board of Governors rulemaking process. We're making some pro progress there. Um, the faculty issues have gone to the University Planning Committee, and then they're now with exec uh, committee until the end of the month. In January, uh, C.B. Wilson will come to the Senate meeting and, and go over some of the key points with the, uh, the faculty rules. Um, and then the other area was academics, so we have an ad hoc committee. Uh, I'm calling it the Ad Hoc Exec Academic Policy Review Committee. And uh, we've met twice, and we've gone through policies regarding attendance, incompletes, transfer transient credits, withdrawals, pass-fail grading option, academic definitions, as well as several Board of Governor rules. Um, and those rules are, they're, they're a little bit further behind uh, the academic, um, uh, I'm sorry, the faculty issues, so they'll go to the Board of Governors meeting, I believe in April, um, for the first reading, and then June for final approval. Um, and then I, I want to make a comment. Going, going through the policies, the academic policies, it's, it's actually been a good experience for us as a committee. You know, we, we have an opportunity to perhaps improve some of the policies or in some cases get some um, clarity on some things that were ambiguous. Um, and, and we've been talking about this at exec and amongst ourselves, and I think we'd like to make this kind of a committee a standing committee. So we'll, we'll be talking about this uh, in Senate and uh, developing it a little bit more. So. Please stay tuned. Um, another announcement um, question. Does anyone here use a student response system like iClicker, something like that? OK. So um, you know we've got different systems throughout campus. And um, there's a, a task force being developed to try to maybe come up with a common approach uh, to these uh, student response systems, whether it be iClicker, PackBack, Top Hat, something like that. Um, some of these companies want to come talk to us and, and give demonstrations. So if you're interested in working on the, this task force, especially if you use these, uh, please, please let me know. And, and we're going to be setting up a meeting probably within the next month or so uh, to go forward with that. Uh, another announcement 
uh, as you came in, you were probably handed a flyer that looks like this, faculty and staff legislation. And this is something that we as a Senate, in particular the Senate Executive Committee, developed in collaboration with the Staff Council. Um, and this is just something that could be handed out to the legislators. Um, and I talked about it, I went over the points last month, uh, but they're all here. Um, one, one point here, because uh, Provost McConnell raised this, was regarding campus carry. This is the second bullet point on the back. We asked that our legislation consider the full impact of campus carry, including the cost of compliance and the potential loss in recruitment and retention of students, faculty, and staff. And she mentioned a resolution. This is something that the Welfare Committee is considering, and if the Senate or Welfare Committee so chooses, we may want to just have this come up as a, a separate resolution uh, here at the Senate, perhaps in the next meeting. Um, and finally, one final announcement. Um, does everyone here know uh, Barbara Dunn? She's the person who greets you when you come in, and um, she's the one who gives you the handouts. More importantly, she's the one who provides support for the curriculum committee, which of course is the hardest working committee uh, in existence. And um, you know, she's been here at WVU for 30 years. 27 of those years has been with the Faculty Senate. And today is actually her last meeting because she's retiring on January 2nd. And Barbara's right there in the back, wave your hand. Why don't we give her a round of applause? Um, and so we all owe a lot to her um, for keeping us on task and organized. Um, and another comment, um, Chad and Judy and myself were trying to organize a retirement party for, uh, for Barb. Uh, we're still working out the details. We think it'll probably be after, right after the next Senate meeting. Uh, we don't really want to have it before then because we'd be competing against all these uh, holiday parties. Uh, but we'll send out a formal announcement once we've set the, uh, the details. Okay, and with that, uh, I'm done, unless there are any questions for me. Yeah, any questions from Pot Potomac State or Tech? Okay, no questions. Um, so, so next up, we have, a, we have a pair of presentations, and the first one is going to be given by uh, Rocky Goodwin with Rob Alsop on West Virginia Forward. Uh, I think we'll have to switch over to the slides. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, so Matt asked that we come and talk a little bit about West Virginia Forward, which is an initiative that you may have heard a little bit about over the course of the last year. I know President Gee has spearheaded this effort, and lots of us have talked about and worked on it over the course of the last uh, 10 or 11 months. It's a partnership with uh, the Department of Commerce, West Virginia Department of Commerce, with Marshall and WVU. And President Gee uh, had worked with uh, an, a, a study similar to this in Ohio and thought that the fact that we're at a crossroads now in West Virginia, where we both are seeing some rapid changes on the economic front and as a land grant institution who's uh, solidly positioned in an R1 institution, but also with a charge of service that we are able to take advantage of some of the changing metrics and to help uh, be a deeper bench for examining how we might chart our path forward. So back in January, we worked on a scope of work with McKinsey and Company and our partners to ask three questions. Those questions first asked us, 
what, given the assets that West Virginia has in place, are some growing sectors, uh, the sectors in the economic sectors that we are positioned to take advantage of. That also was looked at through a lens of diversification of our current economy. We know that the post-industrial movement um, changes, rapid changes in the energy sector and some of the other manufacturing changes really call us to be able to um, look ahead and look around corners. The second one was how do we stack up as a state of West Virginia on some key what we call cross-sector enablers, which is uh, how we stack up in the eyes of job creators and economic development um, assessments with our partner states or our competitor states, uh, states who are nearby us or similarly situated. And the third one, which is really important to make the best use of this information, is how do we actually implement these findings? So that's what we're going to run through today quickly. Um, we just talked about those, the analysis uh, and our external partners, so we're going to skip through some of these slides. We looked toward an eye of being disruptive and really thinking about major seismic shifts as we examine the data that uh, was tested with a series of um, folks from WVU uh, who met, volunteered their time and met over the course of the last nine months, spent a few hours a week, every week, reviewing not only all the data that we have to bring to bear, but also data from the state and global data. And these were some of the economic sectors that we came up with in that analysis. So it gave us a set, an assessment of where we have robust issues um, to help support within sectors, and also where we have some new opportunities that are coming down the pike. You'll see on some of those, like fine chemicals and carbon reinforced plastics, those were identified as downstream opportunities for shale. We understood that our Energy Institute and a number of other folks across campus were already working on upstream opportunities there. Then we looked at economic enablers, and there are a number of things that fit into what uh, a lot of you work on every day in, in these assessments. Let me point us to human capital in particular. That's an area where we know we need to graduate uh, a certain number of students with particular types of degrees that our economy and our job creators are looking for. And we also know that um, our role as educators in higher education is to make sure that our students not only find a path to us, but while they're with us, get the right kinds of skills and the right kinds of opportunities to put, be put on a glide path moving forward. So we'll talk about that. Human capital has actually been identified as the biggest area for growth. And so the reason we want to talk to you all about this is because we're going to really want to link arms with all of you as uh, in your departments, with your students, and a lot of opportunities for research and partnership. The president mentioned funding earlier, also opportunities for funding um, as we examine the West Virginia Forward Opportunities together. We talked about educational attainment. This We're going to click through these pretty quickly, and I'll just say West Virginia doesn't fare well for a four-year degree attainment vis-a-vis um, -vis our neighboring states. Um, we also know that STEM grads continue to be both within the state and externally uh, have been traditionally identified as an area that employers find a hard time, have a hard time finding the right kinds of students and, uh, and workforce, so they give us some suggestions there. Quality of life. Uh, you know, I'm a West Virginian by birth and by choice, so I like it here. But not everybody sees West Virginians' op our opportunities uh, through our lenses. So we want to look at the kinds of metrics that people see when they evaluate West Virginia. And we don't fare well on some of those. Uh, and, and we want to work with our partners to improve there. It gave us, you know, earlier we talked about um, a new, some uh, good progress being made on tourism and hospitality related programs. Uh, so one of the things that we looked at through West Virginia Forward is how we increase our tourism spend in West Virginia, but also how our faculty and students can be linked into these efforts. And I know we already have a number of faculty who are working with uh, Chelsea Ruby and the state tourism plan, which is crafted 
based in part on some of the data we found from McKinsey's uh, analysis. We, we have an average of two nights overnight stay, and uh, our neighboring states have four nights, and we also see a couple hundred dollars less spent here than in other areas. But we have great ideas and partnerships among some of our uh, faculty and students that are already underway. Site certification is another area where, um, again, we're looking to support this partnership to try to help foster good business development here and looking at whether it's partnering with Marshall and GIS or um, looking at deployment teams that would support what they're looking at on site certification and other recruitment opportunities with partnership uh, allows us to tap into those resources and assets that we have at the university. These are the WVU strategies that we talked about uh, in, that really are, speak to what you all have to bring to bear on this type of effort and how we can move this initiative throughout January uh, 18, of 2018 will really be the true launch and kickoff. And these are the types of things that we'll want to uh, have paired up with the university. So academic alignment, investment in talent and research, innovative corporations, and looking at that funding. So just to spend a minute on some of those opportunities, the alignment, sometimes we are, we've talked a lot about silos, um, even on issue areas that we all look at. So opioids um, are, are something that we look at with maybe within health sciences, we'd look at it from social stand, science standpoint and from law and pulling those things together and looking at how we can leverage and align uh, our true land grant mission with our best and brightest minds and research uh, that's happening right now provides not only an opportunity to be transformative in the heart of Appalachia in a state where we have the highest death rate in opioid um, addictions and, and death, but also uh, to help bring to bear funding that I think are, whether you're talking about government dollars or uh, foundation or private dollars, all of those donors want to see an alignment. They want to see something that's multidisciplinary and that links even outside of the university. And we've got a number of folks who have been um, doing that kind of work together. STEM, we talked about there are some, and we'll refer to a report here in a minute where you can find it, but the STEM opportunities uh, that we've all seen bring us forward over the last probably 10 years into an um, understanding of what STEM and STEAM actually are in a more pedestrian way. Has, we now have an opportunity to really dial into how we're providing those offerings, whether it's linking with K-12 or providing stackable opportunities for a career and a lifelong learning uh, trajectory that will bring people through not only K-12 and into a four-year degree here, but um, well after and uh, to in and out of retraining. And so that there are some opportunities that we can talk about over the course of the next year to improve those, um, those offerings. We already have, uh, and this is something you jump right in anytime, Rob, but um, we have some examples of where our innovation and entrepreneurship and um, our, our current complement of centers and researchers and um, students are working on a lot of these issues that we've now been, over the course of the last year, be able to knit together and do a little bit of a gap overlap analysis. Do you want to talk about those? Sure. So if you look at um, one of the things that West Virginia Forward has done is to, affir to affirm a lot of what um, a lot of the building blocks that have been going on across the university for quite some time. and so whether it's tech transfer and a lot of the patent and licensing that we've done to a lot of things have been developed over time uh, with our students, but also with the Brick Street Center, um, uh, our entrepreneurship and innovation clinic, and then some new opportunities that are moving forward to try to bring those opportunities that only I think the university can as the comprehensive land grant and R1 institution um, at the university to um, facilitate and foster job creation everywhere from um, our faculty to our students. Um, and so if you look at um, some of the things that the university has been doing that we really hope um, will bring um, um, some fruit. If you look at 2010 to 2013 uh, as it relates to recruitment in 
um, hiring cluster hires in areas such as radio astronomy, STEM education, water resources, um, shale glass utilization, and re uh, regional health disparities to moving forward 2015 to 2017 and some of the signature programs um, from WVU Medicine. Really, uh, uh, in addition to the great base we had, really an infusion of talent that can help move the university forward. And in particular, a lot of the things that the folks from McKinsey and West Virginia Ford have identified of the type of sectors uh, that we have uh, to help that we can grab onto that can really um, help facilitate um, our economy and economic diversification. Uh, and so with that, we've tried to bring a renewed focus on startups and IP to WVU. And you see a few examples of some recent recruits that have come to the university, uh, either with existing businesses or grants or uh, with themselves an ecosystem. Uh, the latest uh, hire, Dr. Marsh and uh, Albert Wright from uh, the Health Sciences Center in the hospital with the recruitment of Dr. Rezai, a world-class um, neuroscientist from Ohio State um, that has a lot of potential in a lot of different areas as it relates to the neurosciences. So with that, um, I think a lot of people talk about all the venture capital is either in Boston or on the West Coast. Um, some of that is becoming, they're pricing themselves out of the market to give opportunities in the Midwest. And so what we're trying to do is provide some seed capital and venture, venture capital for some of the great ideas that are coming out of the university. So whether it's some internal funding that the university has worked on raising, uh, Huntington Bank has stepped up for our students, innovation uh, for the Launch Lab of 50000 a year for startups for businesses uh, out of the Mountain Air Innovation Fund, and then external private funding. So um, there are a group of investors in the state that have put together a venture capital fund. Um, it's actually had um, completed its first round. I think it's invested in seven companies, two of which are companies that were um, born and raised right here at the university with really significant chances of success. Um, they have started, a couple of those members have started a new fund. Uh, they've actually gotten commitments of $12 million, so they're close to closing that fund. So we're starting to see um, this ecosystem for uh, development of not only intellectual property, but spinning out job creation um, for our state. That's where it really fits in um, and creates great alignment with West Virginia Forward. Uh, and then finally, uh, the university formed a couple of years ago our corporate relations office. Um, we have a lot of great people who work across a lot of different places of the university, and so sometimes it's a little bit difficult for outside businesses to coordinate and collaborate with the university, and so our corporate relations office is designed to provide that concierge high-level service to be an input and a front door for the university moving forward. And so you can see some of the companies where over the past couple of years we've increased that opportunity so that our faculty and researchers can do their work and we help facilitate and coordinate opportunities not only for them, um, for our students. Again, all towards now given additional alignment towards those economic sectors and helping to cure and deal with some of those economic enablers we need to move forward with the university. So uh, Joyce recognized that it is the end of the semester, and I know Lisa said she's grading 13 sections worth of paper, so we will not take too much of more of your time for this presentation, but uh, suffice it to say we've got lots of moving pieces within West Virginia Ford and lots of opportunity. Uh, what we will see, and we'll just do a real quick look ahead for the coming year, we have an MOU that we've executed with Marshall and Commerce. We have a steering committee and working groups that are starting to form on priority issues. So if you go to this West Virginia Forward website that will pop up here, there you go, um, to look at the summary of findings, there are a number of action items, some of which speak to your uh, class projects to some research that you may be able to do, some partnerships with local or state or federal government or foundations, community development, or economic development groups. And we want to be sure we march through and actually that third component of the scope of work I mentioned earlier, the implementation, that we want to be true to executing that in a way that really makes sense. So the working groups that are going to come online first will be those that are time sensitive where we already have work underway, and we just maybe need to align a little bit. Or thirdly, a big project that might take so much time for us to get our heads around. If we don't start now, we're gonna be always uh, behind that project and catching up, and that uh, we have examples of each of those. So if you're interested in 
plugging in with West Virginia Ford or your students may be. I know Blake was here earlier and the student government is looking at uh, identifying some opportunities for students to get engaged and some of them have already done so. But we'd love to see your uh, interests align with the opportunities that West Virginia, afford, West Virginia Ford affords to us in partnership, funding, research, publication opportunities, and really at the heart of it all, also transformative work for uh, our land grant mission. So thanks for your attention. Uh, and again, lots more packed into this report. Go ahead to visit the, the uh, website. And I'm going to give you my mobile number. It's my personal cell, so you can catch me anytime if you have questions. Since I know we're short on time today, it's 304-382-1038. If you want to follow up or have any questions, give me a yell. Um, I don't know if there are any uh, questions for Rocky or Rob. Okay. Again, you could contact uh, either of them offline if you did have a question. Okay, so our next uh, speaker is our Chief of Police, police uh, Bob Roberts, here to talk about campus safety. Well, I'm happy to be with you once again. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you. I want to thank you for all that you do to help us make this campus safe because certainly we don't do it alone. A uh, couple of things I'd like to share with you. One is the crime. Uh, if you look at the statistics from last year, we're pretty much the same as we were the year before. The only one area that has ticked up some is thefts. And there's two areas that you can help us on in that. One is, is locking doors. We have a lot of issues with doors locked. But more importantly are your cars and your vehicles. There are a lot of people in our community today who walk around and look for unlocked cars to steal money and different things out of the cars. So it's really important that we start focusing on locking our vehicles because that is driving up our crime statistics right now. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about today is our Office of Emergency Management. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of events over the past six months to a year from people getting run over by cars, uh, shootings, the Las Vegas incident. You know, you can count all these off. Um, and part of that goes back to what the provost said earlier, the campus carry. Um, if you want to have a discussion, certainly you can invite me. I'll tell you my opinion on campus carry. Um, when you mix it with drugs and alcohol and young people, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but that's the chief's opinion. Um, more importantly, we want you to understand a couple of things where you can help us. One is we have an emergency management plan. Uh, it's online and it's very broad and it's developed to cover an all hazard situation. All that means is, is it covers most anything that can happen in our environment. Then that's supplemented with what we call a BEP, a building emergency plan. Each building on campus has an emergency plan. Those are what we need you to make sure you understand. Why do we want you to understand those? Because if we have an emergency on this campus, a lot of our young people will not know what to do. So they're gonna to look to you to know what to do. And that's why we would like for you to, 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 to know that. One of the projects we're working on with the provost office is to actually put flip charts into all the academic classrooms. These flip charts will provide you instructions on about 95 to 98% of any incident that would happen on this campus or in this community. So if something were to happen, you know, you could at least look at that as a reference. But more importantly, I'd like for you to look at it now so you have a feeling for it. And it's on our website, uh, as well as a couple of other things that I want you to kind of know about. One is our threat assessment team. If somebody's acting out on campus or in your classrooms, send that through to us so that we can pull the professionals together and look at them. Make sure that if there are issues that we can address them before they get out of hand and we have a real disaster on our hands. And with those BEPs, our, our, our logic is very simple. If we can contain a disaster or an emergency situation in a localized building without it spreading out into our campus, it makes it safer for all of us. So that's kind of where we come from. Some programs that we offer here, um, we just got a brand new program called Getting Real with Workplace Violence and another one uh, about how to communicate with people to prevent them from getting into that anxious state where we get into violence. Uh, those are done through our training programs. Be happy to come do those anytime. We can do them during lunch. We've just finished doing some down at uh, Tech. 
Um, for Potomac State, we would be glad to do them there too if you want to reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to do anything we can to make this safer, but what we need is you and your eyes and your ears. If you see something or something's not right, call us. We'd rather go look into something and it be nothing than for us not to get that call and something happen. Um, I've been here now going on 34 years. It's a great place to work because of the community. And it's you folks that make it a great place because you do call and you do get involved. Um, the other thing, and I'll, I'll finish up with this, is if you do not have Live Safe on your cell phones, sign up for Live Safe. It gives you a, an opportunity to contact us if you see lights out, ice on the road, any other kinds of issues, or if you have an issue, you can contact our communication center directly. So I encourage you to take advantage of that if you haven't, and I'll entertain any questions if you may have any. But again, thank you, and you have a great holiday, and it's my pleasure to be with you. Okay, so next is the Curriculum Committee report. Ralph Hutzman. So in the interest of time, um, I'd like to group the three items that are for approval into a single uh, consent agenda like we did before. So uh, Ralph will present all three, make any necessary modifications, and then we'll take questions, uh, points of discussion, objections on any of those, and then vote on all three as one. Does that sound good? That sounds fine. Okay. Um, some of the, my fellow senators like to tease me slash praise me for being brief, and so I'm gonna like ask your indulgence for like 20 seconds to give a shout out to my committee who are wonderful. Um, on Thursday, we had our meeting, which is the first day of finals week, and we reviewed eight program proposals and over 100 course proposals, new and changes. And um, with help from Lou Slimak and the Teaching and Learning Commons, the um, Registrar's Office and Barbara Dunn, so you weren't kidding when you said we were a hardworking committee. So um, thanks to my committee. So we'll go ahead with the motions. So, um, first are the four approval items, and you wanted to lump annexes one through three together, is that yeah. correct? Um, so the new course report, course changes, and capstone course report. Okay. So are there any objections or points of discussion for annexes one, two, or three? Okay. Um, in that case, then we can go ahead and vote. So all those in favor of approving annexes one, two, and three, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Potomac State, how do you vote? Potomac State votes three ayes. And WVU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has three ayes. Okay, the ayes have it, annexes one, two, and three are approved. And then maybe for the four information items, we could group those as well. So the first one is the Annex 4 Graduate Programs Report, and then the other two are a new minor in Addiction Studies and a new minor in Forensic Investigation. Okay. Are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex 4 or either of the two minors? Okay. Um, hearing none, uh, Annex 4, the minor in Addiction Studies and the minor in Forensic Investigation are filed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we have the GEF committee report. Natalie. I have a, I have a quick announcement before I uh, submit Annex 5 for information. So at the end of November, I sent an email to department chairs reminding them that the deadline to transition courses from GEC to GEF is December 31st. And along with that email, I sent a long list of courses that have yet to transition. So I'll send out another email in the next couple of days, another reminder to department chairs. But I'd like to encourage you all to submit your courses for review if they were among uh, any of them on the list. So I have, for your information, GEF Transition Review, Annex 5. Okay. So are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex 5? Okay, hearing none, Annex 5 is filed. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Roy, is Roy here? For, uh, 
report from uh, faculty representative of state government. I saw him earlier in the day. Oh, you know, he has, he's giving us his exam. He told me he might be late. And we have been too efficient. He said, I won't get there until 4.30. Yeah. And we've just been too efficient today. <laughs> so uh, why don't we go ahead and I'll make a minor modification to the agenda and we'll have Stan go next. Um, I'm not gonna help you out, Matt. Right. This won't take too long. Um, unless you want me to talk very slowly. <laughs> Uh, so the, the Board of Governors really hasn't met much since the last time we met, but uh, we did have a meeting the Finance Committee on November 29th that was mostly spent just talking about the financial state of the university to date, and uh, pretty much all of that was spent in an executive session. There is a regular meeting of the Board on December 15th, which will happen uh, between the two December graduation ceremonies, um, with the typical committee meetings being held the day before, and we will continue to take up uh, rule changes and we'll also approve the honorary degree recipients amongst other duties. So that is my report. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> with respect to uh, Roy's report, uh, he, he did give a report to exec, um, although I don't remember exactly what he said, he, but, but there was a ACF meeting that he went to and it was not very well attended. If I recall, like three people were there, which kind of speaks volumes about the current state of Pepsi. Um, and so I'll just ask that he fill us in at the next uh, Senate meeting as to what transpired, if anything, at that meeting. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll move on to new business. Is there any new business? Okay. Um, hearing none, then our, our, the next thing we need to do is um, consider honorary degrees. And so this will require us to go into executive session. So to do that, I'll have uh, Chad move us into executive session. Um, we'll have to vote on it. And then for those of you that are not senators or certain administrators, then we'll ask you to leave once we're in executive session, okay? So. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Senate resolve itself into executive session under Chapter 6, Article 9A, Section 4, Subsection B7 of the Code of West Virginia and the Faculty Constitution to, to avoid premature discussion of an honorary degree. Okay, is there a second? Okay, um, it has been moved and seconded that the committee move into executive session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, opposed? Okay, the motion carries and the time is uh, 4.07. We're in executive session. Um, only senators and certain administrators, including Provost McConnell, uh, are allowed to stay. And those of you who are not senators, um, we kindly ask that you leave and the last person out if you can just close the door. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>